Well, welcome to a place of quality. Uh, Richmond Columbian Properties is working to be a, an advocate for the enhancement of the quality of life in Richmond. It's our mission to encourage uh, community development using neighborhood reinvestment tools through educational programming, citizen engagement, and redevelopment projects. We work to connect people and organizations building a community. We own the William G. Scott House, which is one of the most significant buildings in the Star National Register uh, Historic District. Um, it's one of the key elements of the neighborhood that helped determine the helped determine the inclusion of the neighborhood into the National Register of Historic Places. This was done in 1974, along with another neighborhood called Old Richmond. Since that time, we've added four more National Register of Historic Districts. And I'm sure most of you realize that the designation is something that's very important and creates a great opportunity for uh, development, community building, and character as a ministry. Uh, the speakers today, Marsha Davis, president of Indiana Landmarks. This is the kind of guy who can have relationships with anybody from uh, board presidents, large foundations, corporations, just an ordinary scumbag on the street. He relates to everyone who finds a way to call people. He reminds me a lot of my grandfather. My father told me, your grandfather knew everybody in town. Marsh, you know everybody in the state. Uh, I want to acknowledge my colleagues from Indiana Landmarks. Uh, Brittany Miller is in the back row. She is, is our Eastern Regional Director, uh, it, currently based in Cambridge City, but uh, hopefully soon to be relocating to the neighborhood here in the Reed Memorial Church, or soon to be called the Reed Center. So uh, we'll be neighbors soon. And Suzanne Stannis, who's right in the middle of the room, wave your hand. Uh, she's uh, been a great colleague for, for many, many years. When Matt invited me, or commanded me, is more like it, uh, to speak at this gathering. He made it plain uh, that he, did, he wanted me to talk about historic preservation and the work of Indiana Landmarks in the context of what it and we do to help make communities better. Matt said he didn't want my, quote, dog and pony show. Well, Matt, I don't have a dog and pony show, but whatever that was, I'm not gonna do it. But he said he wanted something more, something different that would illustrate illustrate that we who promote historic preservation truly care about quality of life, about neighborhoods, about people, and not just about old buildings. And that historic preservation can be a catalyst for positive change beyond the buildings themselves. And that to be successful, we must engage communities we work in, and that those communities must take ownership and step up to lead that positive change if our work is to have lasting and positive impact. Now, long ago, it became apparent to me that what we do is about and for people, that saving old buildings is really a means to a greater end. What I also have come to know is that we preservationists have not done a very good job when it comes to conveying that message to many of the communities uh, that we serve. So it's understandable that people don't see the human side of historic preservation, especially when we get caught in the thicket of architectural integrity, when we obsess uh, over things like window replacement, or paint colors, or the use of hardy board, at the expense of promoting affordable, humane housing and neighborhood revitalization. Again, the fault lies more in our messaging than our intent. In truth, historic preservation has made huge and positive impacts in neighborhoods and communities, impacts that transcend the buildings. So I'd like to start from the premise that if there's, if there's a tension be, uh, or conflict between the goals and um, the goals of historic preservation and the greater good of a, of a community, it's, more of, it's a really a problem of perception. We need not choose between people and buildings. That's a false choice and it leads to a zero-sum game that poisons public discourse. Let's look at buildings themselves and how they embody uh, humanity. The renowned early, early 20th century architect Walter, Bur Walter Burley Griffin uh, wrote this about buildings. Buildings are the most subtle 
accurate and enduring records of life. Hence, their problems are the problems of life and not the problems of form. But through the forms and material of buildings, we can gain an insight into the life of the past. In many cases, that is now our only approach. And where archaeology and history have afforded a check, I like to believe that buildings convey the most truth of the mental and spiritual states of various peoples and times. In the aggregate, the architecture of a people certainly represents the greatest amount of human effort applied to the realization of purely human ideals. Translation, buildings are about people. They embody and convey human ideals. Now, delving deeper into the idea that buildings convey human condition, the esteemed cultural geographer Henry Glassie views buildings, especially those built by and for common people, to be as valuable as historical documents in understanding how people lived and what they valued. In his seminal book, Folk Housing in Middle Virginia, Glassie writes this about old buildings and what they tell us about people. He writes, two diseases have crippled and nearly killed the silent artifact as a source for history. Most historians, it seems, continue to view the artifact, in this case, old houses, as only an illustrative adjunct to the literary narrative. Perhaps when the elite is studied, this is not an unintelligent course of research. A knowledge of Thomas Jefferson might be passed on, uh, it might be based on his writings and only supplemented by a study of Monticello, but for most of the people, such as the folks who were chopping farms out of the woods a few miles to the east while Jefferson was writing at his desk, the procedure must be reversed. Their own statements, though made in wood or mud rather than ink, must take precedence over somebody else's possibly prejudiced, prejudiced probably wrong, and certainly superficial comments about them. The historian's benign neglect of silent artifacts and their people is a reasonable, if shallowly reasoned, response to the way that artifacts have been most often studies, studied, uh, obsessively, that is, as ends in themselves. When we have learned to read the silent artifact, history will not be an easier pursuit. But if artifacts, such as the old houses, can be read, then history will become a more plausible pursuit. Now you're all thinking, what the hell does that mean? Um, let me translate. Buildings are about people. They convey and embody human ideals. And while Glassie was writing about buildings in middle Virginia, the same could be stated about the homes that populate street after street in the neighborhoods here in Richmond. One of Glassie's points is that artifacts, in the case buildings, are too often considered by scholars and some preservation people as ends in themselves, as opposed to a, a means of a greater end, to a greater understanding of the people who built them. So our question, and the challenge that Matt put to me, is how do we use the old buildings and the places that we preserve to achieve a greater end beyond the buildings themselves? And how does the preservation of old buildings have a positive people-serving impact on the communities? Examples abound, but let me show you just four examples of our work here at Indiana Landmarks to illustrate these points. Let's start with Lyle Station. Anybody been to Lyle Station? Maybe you know what it is. It's one of the most important historic sites in our state. Lyle Station is the last surviving black farming community in Indiana. It's located in southwest Indiana, west of Princeton in Gibson County. Although early settlers had arrived by the 1830s, the community itself dates from 1849. And in 1886, it was named Lyle Station in honor of Joshua Lyles, a free black who, bought, who brought his family to Indiana in the late 1830s. The high point of this rural settlement, as, as rural black communities were called, settlements, was between 1880 and 1912. The community vote boasted a railroad depot, a post office, lumber mill, two general stores, two churches, and a school. It contained over 50 homes and reached a population of more than 800. The town suffered greatly from the Great Flood of 1913, as did many towns in that region, but it continued as a community, building its most important structure, the Lyle Station Consolidated School, uh, in 1919. It, it served the students from nearby communities as well, Sand Hill and Sugar Bluff, um, it was integrated um, for the first three years, but, but, later, but soon became an all-black school from 1922 until the 1950s. Declining enrollment led to its closure in 1958, 
when it was sold to one of the residents in the community. The landmark building, the most important structure in the community, languished for decades, suffering more than benign neglect. Uh, here we have one of Indiana's most important historic black places, a place that depicts the resilience of black citizens against tremendous odds and codified racism in Indiana. But the school was in perilous condition on its way to extinction, extinction when a group from Lyle Station approached Indiana Landmarks for help. Now, the first step was to form a local organization to take ownership of the preservation effort. Working with our African American Landmarks Committee, we helped establish the Lyle Station Historic Preservation Corporation in 1997. It's a long saga, which I shall condense. Uh, the first goal was to secure the ownership. As we often see, great historic places decline or get demolished because an owner refuses to sell for anything less than a rapacious amount, which was the case here. The building was in near ruin, and the owner wanted the fledgling preservation organization to pay $125,000 for this building. Pressure from the community and the owner's wife, by the way, resulted in a purchase with a net cost of $25,000 with a loan from Indiana Landmarks. And the next step was where do we find the money to restore a ruinous building in an isolated community? Well, we left no stone unturned. The new organization held fundraising events, grants from Indiana Landmarks in the state of Indiana uh, helped sustain the project, but it was a sizable grant from the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, that made the restoration possible. Indiana Landmarks at that time had retained lobbyists in Washington to help with major projects. This was one of them. The lobbyists found a pocket of money in USDA to compensate black farmers for years of policy and funding discrimination. Securing those funds took concerted and bipartisan work here in Indiana and in the U.S. Congress. All the while, the building continued to deteriorate, as you see here. This is what it had become. But in 2003, some six years after Lyle's uh, Station Historic Preservation Corporation was founded, the restoration was complete. The building now includes a heritage classroom where children from surrounding schools experience a day in a 1920s class, uh, classroom. It serves as a history museum as well as a community center, and it offers an array of educational programs that focus on black history as well as agriculture, something the chairman of the Lyle Station Preservation Corporation, Stanley Madison, is absolutely passionate about. The Heritage of Lyle Station is featured in an exhibit on Midwestern rural black settlements in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened in Washington in 2016. Without the Lyle Station school building, the building itself, none of this positive community energy would have emerged. We came perilously close to losing all of that but saving the school building sustained the life of Indiana's last surviving black farming community. It united the community in pursuing a common goal. In this case, historic preservation was a means to a vastly greater end to the benefit of people, those who still live in the community and the thousands more who come to Lyle Station to learn and to be inspired. This is Christian Place in Indianapolis, a second example of our work. Um, historic urban neighborhoods in Indianapolis are desirable places to live as the current real estate listings confirm. But not all that long ago, some of today's hot neighborhoods were neglected and abused. That was true for much of the St. Joseph neighborhood in the, early 1980, in, in the 1980s and the early 1990s. In 1989, alerted of the impending demolition of a large swath of the St. Joseph neighborhood, Indianapolis stepped in to purchase a cluster of residential properties some in wretched condition, yet which possessed a degree of character which we felt was worth saving. Among those were row houses, a rarity in Indianapolis, and all the more so in that these row houses were wooden. The property also included three Queen Anne style houses. One more, please. Um, but buying the properties, that was the easy part. Now, what do you do with a mess like this? Well, we took flack. Indiana Landmarks took flack for owning the property, which most deemed an eyesore. In this case, probably for good reason. Demolition was not an option for us. So we sought a solution that would address a local need, and that is affordable housing. This project called Christian Place for the original owner who built the complex in 1885 was Indiana Landmarks' first venture into affordable housing development. 
to accomplish the complicated task of attaining and syndicating affordable housing tax credits, as well as assembling a smorgasbord of lending and grant-making partners, Indiana Landmarks, which was then known as Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana, created a for-profit subsidiary called Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana Housing, Inc. And in 1992, hired a consultant named Frank Hegeman to lead that effort. The goal was to create 29 one and two room two-bedroom units as affordable housing, which 30 years ago was for people earning less than $15,000 a year. Rents were set at $275 to $400 per month. Construction got underway in 1993, and by 1994 it was completed. As required by tax credit rules, we held the property for 15 years and then sold it. Today it's market rate housing, but still quite affordable. The project was not just about the old building saved, but about the elimination of blight without destroying historic buildings, and about op providing opportunities for people of limited means, allowing them to enjoy the benefits of decent housing in a rising neighborhood. The transformation of these properties then sparked an economic revival in the St. Joseph neighborhood and led to the transformation of slumlord-held properties such as this into decent and humane housing. And there's a worthy postscript to this project. Frank Hageman, whom we brought in from Connecticut as a consultant for Christian Place, stayed in Indianapolis and established an organization called Partners in Housing, a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving and providing housing to people experiencing chronic homeless, homelessness. Their residences include people uh, their residents include people suffering mental and physical disabilities and addictions. This organization has since then has taken on 11 buildings, uh, including this prominent landmark uh, uh, in Indianapolis, and has created 602 units and houses over 600 people, a poignant outgrowth of Indiana Landmark's efforts to save some old dilapidated row houses. Now at the opposite end of the housing spectrum, we have North Meridian Street in Indianapolis, famous for its many blocks of uninterrupted residential architecture, much, much from the 1920s and 30s, when homes of the affluent were clad in period uh, revival styles such as Tudor, Tuscan, Mission, Norman, et cetera. Here are just some of the examples of these properties. Okay, hold it. With the city's relentless push northward, uh, North Meridian Street on the near north side suffered much degradation due to commercial sprawl. In the 1960s, Meridian Street residents formed the Meridian Street Foundation to stop the encroachment from the south. Then in 1969, the Indiana State Highway Commission revealed plans to widen Meridian Street. It was then a state highway. The reaction from the homeowners was fierce, but the crisis was averted through court action. Then protection came in 1971 with the state legislation that established the Meridian Street Preservation Commission, which thrives to this day. Now, why do I mention all this? Well, in the 1980s, Indiana Landmarks launched the effort to list this 17-block stretch of North Meridian Street in the National Register of Historic Places. My colleague from Indiana Landmarks, Suzanne Stannis, was tasked with that job and got it done. But it was more than an academic exercise and more than a desire to add prestige to an already prestigious area. In order to sell the idea of the National Register listing, which many wrongly believed imposed property restrictions, we held cultivation events and hosted parties for the homeowners. We embarked on several years of home tours along Meridian Street, and we published a book on the history and architecture of North Meridian Street. Well, that process inspired a comment from a longtime Meridian Street homeowner. He said this, and I'll never forget this. He said, before we embarked on this National Register process, we were simply a street of homes and strangers. We maybe knew our immediate neighbors to the north or the south, but we were not connected. Now we are a neighborhood. So the lesson here is simple, a basic preservation tool listing in the National Register of Historic Places can lead to a much greater end, in this case, a sense of true community. One last example I'll, I'll share with you is in Wabash. Uh, in the summer of 2020, a slumlord who owned well over 20 properties in Wabash died. When community leaders learned that his properties would be, were to be put to auction, they asked if Indiana Landmarks would be interested in acquiring uh, 
those with historic value. So we identified six homes in the East and National Register Historic District that held promise as individual properties and collectively as a catalyst for community revitalization. Just go through a couple, a bunch of these houses, Seth. Our goal was to purchase the properties, stabilize them, and then sell them with restoration covenants and to return them to single family homes as they were intended to be, not as the subdivided tenements they had become. Our pro forma indicated, no surprise, that Indiana Landmarks would take quite a loss on the project. So we asked for community support to supplement the 300,000 we had already committed to the purchase of these six houses at auction, which we did in August of 2020. The response from the Wabash community was immediate and exceeded our expectations. The mayor, the Community Foundation of Wabash County, local businesses and foundations, and individual donors all stepped up to help us eliminate blight. But again, not by demolishing historic properties, but by rehabilitating them and restoring dignity to the houses and to the neighborhoods. This was uh, the first uh, property that was sold um, with uh, protective covenants, and I, in fact, we featured it on our, our annual report, so we, we're, we're well underway with, with this project in, in Wabash. Um, and then since, since that project got underway, thanks to this strong partnership with the Wabash community, uh, we have been able to, to acquire three more properties um, to add to our collection now, now, of, now at uh, nine. All that's good in itself, and uh, blight elimination through preservation is, is a good thing, but there's more to it. One of the homes we acquired held special promise for a, a remarkable and unexpected partnership. We were approached by a faith-based uh, women's recovery program called Waypoint to see if we would donate one of the properties, in this case the largest and most expensive of the lot, uh, to the organization for the purpose of establishing a shelter home for women suffering addiction. This is what it looked like when we purchased it. You can't even see the house. And so uh, with a little bit of work underway, so they asked if we would donate the property to us, which, which we agreed to do. And um, as before, the community rallied behind this idea. The same people from the mayor, the community foundation down, uh, all behind it. So after doing initial stabilization and a little tree trimming, uh, we donated the property to Waypoint. And we are working with them now on, on raising additional funds, thanks, ad additional funds to complete the rehabilitation of the property, which will house 12 women at any given point, helping them get their lives back on track. Now, this is a wonderful example to illustrate what Matt Stegall's point is, that historic preservation is about people and could be a powerful tool for serving human needs, even spiritual needs. One of the Waypoint leaders described this project as, quote, restoring buildings and restoring souls. The last point I'll make is this. Now, this project's success required full participation of the community, from the mayor, civic leaders, foundations, and individual donors. Indiana Landmarks cannot do this work alone. Yeah. So I've belabored the point, I think you probably get it by now, that historic preservation is not an end in itself, but can serve as a means to a greater end in service to people. And I would hope that we could uh, embark on similar work here in, in the Richmond community, as we're trying to do throughout the state, to partner the goals of historic preservation with human serving needs. There's nothing more gratifying in our work to see things come together like that. It's not just about saving an old building. It's about building community and creating quality of place. So that is my presentation, and I'd like to uh, see if there are any questions that I could answer, or maybe continue discussion. One of the, um, the things that I, I, I could have mentioned in here as well is, is um, our work with sacred places, uh, old churches. Uh, these are often seen as, as uh, albatrosses to congregations. Um, I used to, I was, for a time I was senior warden of a church in Texas, which was a large historic church in a very small community and quite a, a capital drain on the congregation. And sometimes people would say to me, you know, our mission is not, is not maintaining an old building. Our mission is, is, is ministry and worship. So how do we take these old buildings and put them in service to the mission of these churches? 
So we have a part, we have a program now called Sacred Places Indiana that that uh, aspires to do just that. We we work with congregations to help them understand how they can open their doors to the community, be more relevant, and maybe along the way make some extra money to keep that old building standing and maintained. So it's it's ingrained in, in what we do. But uh, as I said, I've belabored the point because so often people think that our work is is all about buildings at the expense of people, and I assure you it is not. Any, any uh, questions about our work, what we do? I'm happy to, yes sir. How do you uh, select and prioritize projects? I mean, Richmond has maybe a hundred, several hundred mm -hmm. historically significant buildings in poor repair. Uh, it, it, that's a, a, did you all hear the question, how do we prioritize which, which uh, projects we take on? It's a good question and we get it a lot. And uh, the, the, uh, the absolute answer is the commitment of the community. Um, there are many small cities like Wabash around Indiana, but in this case, that community came together. They had a, a common vision uh, and they worked together to join forces. And they, they appealed to us and drew us in. All these projects that I, that I showed you were not ones that we just said, oh, we want to do this, that, or that. It's when people would come to Indiana Landmarks and say, we, we've got a project, we've got a commitment to doing something, will you work with us? That's how we select. You're right, I mean, there are thousands of properties across the state that we could, that we could engage in and, and, and seek to preserve. But it's where you have that local commitment, the local buy-in at as many levels as possible that allows historic preservation, whether it's us or a, a local organization, to succeed. It requires that that uh, community commitment. Marsh, can you talk a little bit about the Reed Center? Matt asked if I would talk about uh, the Reed Center, the former Reed Memorial Presbyterian Church. Um, yes, we've been working with community leaders here for the last uh, few years to um, secure ownership of, of that property. A new nonprofit will, is, Mary, are we just about there? How close are we to getting the nonprofit? Waiting on the, uh, the, uh, the 501c3? Yeah. yeah, waiting on the, on the yeah, nonprofit yeah. designation. Once that's underway, ownership of the, um, of the property will be transferred to the new organization. Um, uh, it's a spectacular church. As I said earlier, Indiana Landmarks plans to relocate to that church to be part of its new life and to be a, a a um, rent-paying tenant to help support, to help pay the the the, the, uh, the light bill, um, and to bring to bring that property to life. But there's a, I think it's, it holds promise as a as a community center for arts and culture and uh, religious services as well. It's not ex exclusively one thing or the other. It's going to be much like our state headquarters in Indianapolis functions. As a uh, we have a, we, our state headquarters is an old Methodist church that was that had gone out of business and really had no hope. Um, we uh, um, embarked on an extensive restoration of that property and uh, we ha have our state headquarters there, but it also, uh, two thirds of the building serves other purposes of uh, concerts, lectures, programs, weddings, weddings and weddings, that's our cash cow. Um, Reed Memorial is a spectacular building. I'm sure all of you from Richmond have been in there. It is uh, one of the most um, important interiors we have in Indiana with every window being a Tiffany glass, so um, I, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's a, I think I'm proud of the fact that we'll be moving our office into this neighborhood and hopefully can add to the uh, revitalization which is, which is happening. Did I miss anything on that? Yeah. So are, is Landmark doing anything else in Wayne County other than Reed Center? Is Landmark's doing anything else in Wayne County other than, than Reed Center? Well, I asked Brittany in the back, who is our Eastern Regional Director. Um, I know she's been active in, in uh, Cambridge City. We've got, we've got some projects there. Um, what else are we doing, Brittany? In the I am all over Wayne County all of the time. Um, it's houses. We work with uh, Matt. We're working with um, Richmond uh, Neighborhood Restoration on various projects. Yeah, we currently have a loan out to right. Yeah, so we, we've got we've got money invested in Richmond. We have money invested in, in the church right now as a loan to the Whitewater Presbytery. We've got a loan to Richmond Restoration Services. Um, so we're putting our money and uh, and, and and to the Columbian 
properties here. Matt is, is, a, is a regular customer of ours, and uh, we're helping with the rehabilitation of the, of the Scott House, uh, the boiler and interior work. Um, and as, as, as Brittany said, I mean, she's working with individual property owners, local organizations uh, all the time. So, Martin, yeah. Us did two houses across the street. Yeah. yeah. We, we did, did two houses, houses across the street with Columbian Properties. Um, that's why Columbian Properties received this award for the good work that they've done over time, and it's been a, we've been a wonderful partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, you talked about how change is brought about by communities coming together. And my question is, does Indiana Landmarks have a process that kind of outlines how a community can be brought together? The question is, do we have a process by which communities can be brought together? Um, Kind of. Uh, it's because every situation is different, every community is different. But um, one of the things that we've been really good at through the years is when there is a, a local need, let's use Lyle Station as an example. There was no organization uh, of any kind at that point. And so by them, by working with us, we helped them form a, 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 a corporation, a nonprofit corporation, which then led to community engagement. But it starts, it so often starts with either a, a, a neighborhood association or a, a local nonprofit, someone through whom landmarks or the state or other, other uh, sources of funding or guidance, someone to work with in an organized fashion. And if you don't have that kind of baseline, it really starts at the neighborhood level, I think, in a, in a city like Richmond. Uh, having, having neighborhood associations that are, that are strong and focused. We talked this morning about, about uh, starting with starting incrementally with things like uh, like pulling weeds and then it just simple things my neighborhood tomorrow in, in Indianapolis we're having a neighborhood cleanup and these are the things that, that make a difference and they help build so if you don't have those really low uh, granular level level uh, local efforts it's a lot harder for organizations like ours to to be effective did that answer your question thank you yeah. Yes. What role would you say local government plays in bringing the community together and um, saving historic places? What role does local government play? Well, it should play a major role. It shouldn't be the only role, though. It, it should be, it should be a, a, a partner with the philanthropic community, with, with the nonprofit community, and um, hopefully be responsive. We've seen some local governments that, that uh, again, I'm going back to the Wabash example, here you had I mean, the mayor was all in for what we were doing, and, and members of his council, they committed uh, not only money, but also um, moral support, uh, public, uh, public support, which helped bring, more, uh, bring in more money and more community support. So, the, I mean, the role is absolutely critical, but it, again, it should not, we should not look to government to solve our problems either. We have to work with them. And, um, but if they're not at the table, then there's probably something missing. Well, thank you. You've got yeah, yeah. What, what to say? I was curious to know the building that was just uh, tore down right here on Main, uh, the big complex. They were going to fix it up, but what caused ultimately the city to not get behind it, and why did it have to be tore down? The question was why was the building on Main Street yeah. demolished? I, I have to uh, uh, defer to a Richmond. Resident to answer. Yeah, yes, yes. Right. Right. That's the brick that Ryan got. Oh, I missed that. It was part. torn down so Matt could get a brick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I don't want to get it thrown out. I, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know the reason for this demolition. Anyone? Is there? Is there a? Uh, well, it was torn down because the place has fallen apart and nobody seemed to want to do anything about it. Now, apparently there are ideas in the works that that whole block is to be taken down to be replaced by a command center for police and fire service. So I was just wondering how the historical significance of saving buildings factors in with maybe other development things to come in. I mean, yeah. 
How does the historical significance of a property factor into the redevelopment? Yeah, versus yeah. those things like that, because yeah. I thought the focus is to preserve those types of structures. Yeah. Well, we would hope. Uh, I mean, not everybody cares about old buildings. We have to recognize that. Some people just don't. Uh, you're probably going to hear a little bit more about apathy uh, later this afternoon. Some people just frankly don't care, and we have, we have to recognize that as a reality. But for those who do care and see possibilities, um, there, are, there are some things that we do uh, on a, on a uh, regular basis. One is to, to acknowledge the historical significance of a property through various designations. We have uh, a, a, several, a lot of Richmond is, de is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. That adds a, a level of stature. It doesn't, necessarily, it doesn't protect a property necessarily, but it does create uh, an honorific designation which does resonate with people. I used that in the illustration of, of North Meridian Street. Uh, to recognize that significance um, helped that community come together and, and become a neighborhood. But from an economic standpoint, there, there are also uh, certain tools that uh, those of you who work in community development here know that, that um, if there are, there are several grant programs through the state of Indiana that uh, uh, acknowledge uh, National Register listing as, as, a, as a criterion for for p possible funding. Um, on, on larger scale projects, uh, National Register listing, uh, that is acknowledging the historical significance of a property, is, is uh, critical for receiving historic rehabilitation tax credits. That's an economic incentive which has been critical to, uh, it's restored, uh, the, I think the last statistics I had, something like 43,000 buildings across America and billions of dollars in, in, in private investment in properties, all sparked by these historic tax credits. Um, we need a state tax credit in Indiana, and that's another topic for another day perhaps, but uh, we will be looking to our, our colleagues uh, around the state to, to support us in the Indiana legislature in the upcoming session, which is a budget year, and uh, we need your help in promoting uh, the historic tax credit at the state level. We're one of, I think, about 15 states that does not have a tax credit, and we're losing, uh, we're losing business, we're losing development, to other states that have robust tax credits, and we're surrounded by them, and yet Indiana does not have one. So we'll need your help uh, with, with your elected state officials uh, in the next, in this upcoming year. So that's a tool, and that's one, one way that historic designation, recognizing historical significance, has real, a real dollar impact. Yeah. If this building was in a local historic district, it would have had your get a COA or a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition? The question is, if this building were in a, a locally designated uh, district, it would have required a certificate of appropriateness for demolition. That is the way it should work, yes. Is that the situation here? And, and could you explain how the local historic district then has some more teeth than a national uh, historic district listing? Yeah, so the national register listing, it, it does not, does not um, restrict what you do with your property. Um, there, the, the, there is a protective measure is in that if there are federal funds or state funds involved in a project that, uh, that will affect a national register property, national register property, it, go, it, it requires a review process. It doesn't guarantee an outcome, but it requires a review process. And that's why every state in the nation has a state historic preservation office. They do those reviews. Uh, classic example we're going through right now in, in downtown Indianapolis, the widening of the highway. There's an extensive review. Every, every square inch of that project has to be reviewed for, for its impact on the neighborhoods around it because they're listed in the National Register. But if you, as a, as a private property owner, if you have a home that's listed in the National Register, whether it's in a district or individually listed, you're not restricted in any way. This is a big misconception that we, we try to disabuse people of all the time. Not very effectively, but we try. Um, real protection, as you noted, comes through local designation, through a, through a local ordinance, a locally enacted district or districts, and then, and then being where, when, when demolition or alterations need to be approved by a local preservation review board or a historic preservation commission. Some, uh, in many cases, that, that is a very effective tool. But uh, commissions are populated by people, and people are not perfect, and uh, sometimes it doesn't work the way we want. But in, 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 the, 
in the balance, these preservation commissions are hugely beneficial to preserving historic fabric. I don't know what happened here in Richmond with, with the, the case that you, that you mentioned, if that were reviewed. In some cases, uh, a, 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 a determination that a building is, um, use the common word condemned or beyond, is a public safety hazard, can often um, uh, trump, if you will, the, the uh, rulings of a preservation commission. But again, I, I, I'm speaking in general terms because I don't know the particulars of that building. All right. Well, thank you. You've been a, a kind audience. I appreciate the chance to be with you and show some of the examples. Thank you.